It's 10 o'clock and with the Sunday night news now on BBC One, Michelle Hussein. Documents show how the former FIFA vice president, Jack Warner, benefited personally from a $10 million payment. The $10 million, Jack, where did the money go? The $10 million, where did it go? The money sent on behalf of South Africa was meant to go to grassroots projects in the Caribbean. Instead, documents suggest that it was used for cash withdrawals, personal loans and to launder money. Mr Warner, who's been indicted by the FBI for corruption, denies wrongdoing. Also tonight, more than a thousand migrants are rescued by a Royal Navy warship off the coast of Libya. President Obama joins talks in Germany, saying that he hopes Britain will stay in the European Union. And the hour is out! Bradley Wiggins has done it! Can't hear it! And Britain's top cyclist smashes the world record for the distance covered in one hour. Good evening. The BBC has seen evidence that the former FIFA vice president, Jack Warner, personally benefited from $10 million given by South Africa to pay for football development in the Caribbean. The document suggests that Mr Warner used the payments for cash withdrawals, personal loans and to launder money. He denies any wrongdoing. This exclusive report is from Ed Thomas in Trinidad and Tobago. It contains some flash photography. Morning, Mr. Warner. It is the $10 million question at the centre of football's global bribery scandal. Where did the money go? Do not, do not, do not, do not. $10 million, where did it go? Cash promised by South Africa and sent via FIFA to this man, former FIFA vice president Jack Warner. Can you tell us where the $10 million went, Jack? Mr. Warner, where did the $10 million go to? Can you tell us one project, Mr. Warner? Can you tell us about one project that you spent the money on? US investigators have questions too, because they believe the money was a bribe to guarantee South Africa would host the World Cup. Jack Warner doesn't want to talk about the missing millions, but our investigation has uncovered this. Detailed information that reveals for the first time where every dollar of the FIFA money was spent and moved around. Seen exclusively by BBC News, the wire transfers from FIFA $10 million sent to accounts controlled by Jack Warner. Money South Africa claims was for Caribbean football, its so-called diaspora legacy programme. But the documents show it was used for cash withdrawals, credit cards and alleged money laundering. First, consider this place, JTA Supermarkets. Nearly $5 million was paid to its headquarters and there's not a football pitch in sight. These documents reveal that from January 2008 to March 2009, $4,860,000 was transferred to JTA supermarkets. US prosecutors say that money was then paid back to Jack Warner in local currency. Now, consider the cash withdrawals. Our papers show nearly $360,000 of the FIFA money was distributed to Jack Warner's personal drivers and assistants. And then there's this, $1.6 million in personal loans for Mr Warner and payments to his own credit cards. $10 million sent by FIFA at the request of South Africa money spent by Warner with no obvious checks or balances. We presented our investigation to Brent Sancho, Trinidad and Tobago sports minister and former footballer. I am devastated because a lot of that money should be back in football. And what should happen to Jack Warner now? With this evidence now he will have to, he has dodged a bullet for too many times and it's time for him to answer for his actions. South Africa didn't give me any $10 million, right? Jack Warner refused to comment on our report. He has said he is innocent and will soon reveal the truth of what happened inside FIFA. At Thomas, BBC News, Trinidad and Tobago. Well, back at FIFA, the head of its Audit and Compliance Committee has said that Qatar and Russia 
could lose their rights to host the World Cup if evidence of bribery emerges. Our sports news correspondent Richard Conway is with me and where does this take things, Richard? Well, as we've seen from Ed Thomas's report there, the confidence and the integrity that many feel should be present in those previous World Cup decisions is slowly being eroded. Um, we saw today in some newspapers reports about how Morocco may have legitimately been the winners of the 2010 World Cup. Uh, but again, that's something that the investigators are going to have to look into and FIFA will as well. The more worrying thing for FIFA tonight will be the future World Cups 2018 and 2022 going to Russia and Qatar respectively. Now Domenico Scala, FIFA's head of audit and compliance saying today those World Cup rights could be taken away. That's consistent with what FIFA have said before because the timing on this is everything. Uh, both those countries have strenuously denied any wrongdoing uh, but FIFA's own inquiry as well turned up uh, you know, a clean bill of health for them. But that inquiry didn't have uh, powers to look into phone records or bank accounts or to subpoena witnesses. The FBI I certainly does. This is worrying times for FIFA and for those World Cups. Richard Conway, thank you. A Royal Navy warship, HMS Bulwark, has rescued more than a thousand migrants off the coast of Libya. The ship was sent to the Mediterranean by the government to help the rescue effort for migrants whose boats run into difficulty trying to reach southern Europe. More than 43,000 people have already crossed the Mediterranean this year, a 50% increase on last year's numbers. And it's estimated that more than 1,600 people have drowned trying to make the crossing so far this year. Well, our defence correspondent Jonathan Beale is on board HMS Bulwark and sent this report. At first light, HMS Bulwark launched one of her helicopters to search for the boats filled with migrants. It didn't take long to find them. Up on the bridge, the ship prepared to launch her own boats to begin the rescue. Bulwark's only been patrolling these waters for a month and has already saved more than 1,700 people. This would be her busiest day yet. Well, at the moment, we're probably looking at upwards of six, 700, and those are, those are just the ones we know about this morning, bearing in mind it's, it's only just gone 8 o'clock, so we've actually been tracking these for four to five hours already. And this is what they are being rescued from. This one boat was crammed with nearly 400 people, some stored like cargo beneath the deck by the gangs of traffickers who just left them to drift without an engine in a vessel never designed to cross the Mediterranean. Some with no life jackets either and barely enough room. No surprise that they scramble to safety. From chaos to hope of a better life. Now about to board a Royal Navy warship, some still sick from their perilous journey. This woman had to be carried off after fainting from dehydration. There are now hundreds of migrants who've been rescued coming on board HMS Bulwark. Their only belongings, the clothes they are wearing. And this seems to be part of an unstoppable tide of people leaving Africa trying to reach Europe. Among the rescued were Syrians who'd fled one war and Africans who'd gone to Libya for work but then had to flee another conflict. They'd each paid $1,000 to human traffickers trading on their misery. Among them, 26-year-old Tor, a Christian originally from South Sudan, who had to leave his young family behind. But I don't know if they're alive or they die. Tor says he wants to start a new life in the UK. But he is just one of more than a thousand people that have been picked up today by just one British warship. And no one knows when this human tide, making its way from Africa to Europe, will end. Jonathan Beale, BBC News, on HMS Bulwark. Results from Turkey's election so that, that President Erdogan's party has lost its parliamentary majority. He was hoping to gain enough support to change the constitution and extend his powers. But his party is now expected to have to form a coalition and the main Kurdish party has won enough votes to allow it to enter parliament for the first time. Let's join our correspondent Mark Lohan who's in Istanbul tonight. How significant is this result going to be for Turkey and, and for the region, Mark? Hugely significant, Michelle. This is potentially the start of a new political era here. It might look like a celebration at the governing AK party headquarters, but I can tell you it hides despondency 
because the party that seemed unstoppable here for 13 years has lost its majority and suddenly seems very, very vulnerable indeed. The, the era of Recep Tayyip Erdogan's dominance of Turkish politics appears to possibly be at an end. He is a man who divides opinion, loved and loathed in equal measure, adored by his supporters for transforming the economy, for giving a voice to more religious Turks, hated by his critics for eroding democracy and muzzling free speech. Michel, this election matters because Turkey matters. This is the vital Western ally in a volatile Middle East, a NATO member that borders Syria and Iraq, often held up as a country that combines Islam and democracy. Its political leadership, its political path are now uncertain, and that will have ramifications far beyond Turkey's borders. Mark Lowen in Istanbul, thank you. President Obama has said that he hopes Britain will stay in the European Union and that the government should spend a minimum of 2% of economic output on defence. He's been speaking at the G7 talks in Germany, where David Cameron announced the deployment of a further 125 troops to Iraq to help counter Islamic State militants. Our diplomatic correspondent James Robbins sent this report. It doesn't get more Bavarian than this. A whole Alpine village turns out for President Obama. He wanted to shake every hand. Chancellor Merkel despaired of keeping control of her most powerful guest. But the bonhomie had a greater significance. Washington sees Germany as the stable giant of the European Union. And President Obama was about to intervene very deliberately in Britain's EU referendum debate. We have no closer partner. Meeting David Cameron one on one, the president urged Britain not to exit the EU. I would note that one of the great values of having the United Kingdom in the European Union is uh, its leadership uh, and strength on uh, global challenges. Uh, and so we very much uh, are looking forward to. The United Kingdom staying a part of the European Union because we think that this influence is positive not just for Europe but also for the world. David Cameron simply did not respond, talking only about other issues. Uh, as you said, Barack, there are so many issues to discuss at this meeting and bilaterally uh, with our very close partnership and the partnership between Britain and the United States, that special relationship. Uh, but they all really come down to two words uh, prosperity and security. To add to the Prime Minister's woes, President Obama apparently also pressed him to keep military spending at 2% of gross domestic product as the price for being a pillar of NATO. If all that was awkward for David Cameron, he is...